Hey guys, if you're anything like Beth and I, you're always searching for new true crime podcasts. Well, we'd like you to check out What Happens in the Woods. It's a new podcast with husband and wife, Bryce and Jessica, who share a love of true crime. They moved to Seattle, Washington, and found out that some crazy stuff happens in the Pacific Northwest. So if you want to venture out of the closet and take a walk in the woods, join Jessica and Bryce every first and third Friday of the month. Check out their trailer after this and subscribe to What Happens in the Woods today. Hey, podcast listeners. Are you obsessed with true crime? If you're like us, you can't get enough. Hi, I'm Jessica, and together with my husband, Bryce, we created a little podcast by the name of What Happens in the Woods. We're just your average couple living normal lives who felt the need to share our love for true crime and sensational cases with the world. We talk about crime stories that take place in the Pacific Northwest, and we want nothing more than to share them with you. Come join us every first and third Friday of the month as we take a deep look into the dark and twisted stories of the Pacific Northwest here at What Happens in the Woods. Episodes are available for download on any listening platform or on our website, www.whathappensinthewoods.com. It isn't for the faint of heart, but we promise it'll be worth it. Hey, welcome back to Crimes and Closets. This is Christy, and I am in a closet in North Carolina. And this is Beth, and I am in the same closet in North Carolina. Yes, y'all, you heard it right. We are in the exact same space. I'm looking at her right now, and it's so freaking exciting. <laughs> yes, and you look beautiful. <laughs> oh, so do you. <laughs> so today we are Crimes and Closet. Yes. Oh, yes. We are. <laughs> so excited. Yes, we are very excited to be together. We are on, we are social distancing. Mm -hmm. About six feet apart right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. Very responsibly, but we have a loved hanging out. Yeah, it's been good. It's been good. So I kind of know what's been going on in your worlds, but do you got anything happening outside your closet I yeah you one. are happening outside my closet yes. and inside my closet you are my closet <laughs> she's so cheesy <laughs> it's true <laughs> oh my gosh anyway yeah we actually got to hang out the other night I, of course again socially distancing around a fire and it was very funny because, you know, nothing changed. We hadn't seen each other in person in I don't know how long. And we were talking about true crime. <laughs> our husbands were talking about work, which probably is similar to what happened before. Just real life. Yep. Yeah. It was really fun. So, so. we got the rundown uh, version of our cases. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So super exciting. Love, love hearing from people too. We've been actually in touch with some people on Facebook about cases and that's been really cool to, to be able to do. So keep on, keep on reaching out to us people. We love it. Yeah. Thank you guys so much for all the love and for listening and putting up with our cheesy jokes, my cheesy jokes this week because <laughs> I'm feeling all the love. <laughs> So now we should talk all the murder. Yes, yes. And I do have a murder. I have a I'm murder for so you. I'm so glad. An unsolved one. So hopefully Ooh. we can, I don't know, maybe we'll figure it out. <laughs> but anyways, um, this one is about Nanette Krentel. And it takes place in Lacombe, Louisiana, which is about 49 miles north of New Orleans, which everyone Ooh. is, I'm sure, pretty familiar with. So Nanette was a 49-year-old retired pre-kindergarten teacher. Props to her because I was a pre-kindergarten teacher too. Loved it. Awesome. Also retired. Yes, also, I'm also <laughs> retired, but I'm not 49, guys. And she was married to Stephen Krentel, who was the fire chief of Covington District 12, which was in the same city or town, whatever it is. And Stephen had a son, Justin, from a previous relationship, but he was older, so, you know, they were still kind of empty nesters. And on July 14th, 2017, the day started pretty normal. Um, 
she set out the clothes for Steve before he left for work and they oh, chatted. You know, one of those kind of wifeys. Normal. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I don't know if that was usual, I guess, since it says it was normal, but <laughs> I hmm. don't do that. I wouldn't pick out anything my husband would actually want to wear, probably. <laughs> but anyway, and there is surveillance, surveillance footage of Nanette's car at a McDonald's that morning after Steve left for work. And some people have said that it doesn't, it might not be her, but there's really nothing that proves it's it's not. It's her car, goes through McDonald's, and then minutes later is driving back into their home because they have surveillance surveillance cameras out. And so it shows her coming back. So no reason to really think that it's not her, but there has been some speculation for some reason that maybe it's not. Hmm. I don't know. I didn't find any reason to think it wasn't, but. So, so this is July 14th, 2017, and Steve's unit is responding to a fire at his own house around 2, 2.30 in the afternoon. And Nanette was found dead in the master bathroom on the floor face up. Two hours later, the fire, the state fire marshal was called in to investigate I've seen photos of this house and it was demolished. And I read reports that the roof had collapsed and had to be removed before they found her body. So it was, I mean, just completely destroyed because they lived on a hundred acres of property. And so they are even speculating that the fire could have been burning for like an hour before anybody actually oh, called it in and got to it. So it was just, I mean, everything's charred. Cars in the garage were gone, everything. So... Steve informs her father of the death. They live in Iowa. And her father immediately calls Nanette's sister, Kim. And she stated that she cried immediately and started yelling, they killed her. This may not be the initial conclusion that I would have come up with based on that information. You know, you just, to me, it would be like, well, the fire started somehow and she didn't get out and she died. But her sister's yelling, so they killed her. Who killed her? Right, exactly. Who was they? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly my question, because that's not what I would have thought. However, an autopsy was done on Nanette, and now her sister didn't know about this autopsy yet. That was her immediate reaction just to the basic information that there was a fire. But an autopsy was done at 9 a.m. the following day, and they found a bullet in Nanette's head. Oh, wow. And the state fire marshal declares that the fire was intentionally set. But that's all that they'll say about it. They won't give much more information, just that they know it was intentionally set. Well, normally that means there's like a something flammable, right. like gasoline yes. or accelerant. Yeah. Accelerant, yes. Right. And the thing about this is that the family wasn't even told that the bullet was found until a week later, actually, the morning of her memorial service. Somebody read um, a blog post that leaked this information, and so then they called. Oh, my gosh. And they found out that it was true, and that, you know, police apologized and whatnot. But I have no idea why they weren't told, but they basically found out by reading a blog. <laughs> that literally takes it from being an accidental death to a murder. Right. Yeah. On the day of the memorial service that you found out from the internet. Exactly. So, anyway. And... There, there's a few more details that I'll discuss later from the fire marshal not saying anything more about the intentional fire, but I'm, I don't want to kind of get into that just yet, but I'm gonna, we'll hold on to that too. Okay. I'll let you keep your cards. Yeah, I'm going to keep my notes here. Um, Nanette's family arrives from Iowa two days after her death, and they immediately go and drive to the scene of the fire. And when they arrive and they just take a look at the debris, they were surprised at what they saw because... So when I did see a picture of it, it was, there was complete soot like all over the ground, which in their opinion, why was there any debris left? Because you should be sifting through this. It should be getting cleared to find, you know, what out, what happened? How did the fire start? What not? But there's just complete debris everywhere. And they also found an AR gun. Well, I don't even know that. That's, I guess that's an assault rifle, right? So is AR gun an official way to say it? Or are you just saying AR? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, I'm not a gun person, guys. <laughs> anyway, so an AR 
that was there and they could see it. They didn't go on the property like they were standing on the edge and they could see this gun that the police clearly didn't take. And it's two days after the fire. Like laying in the just debris? Laying, yeah, somewhere in the Unburnt? Debris. Mm-hmm. Undebris? Un- well, that I don't know. Oh. But they just found this gun. Well, my gosh, if, if the house was demolished and the cars were melted down to the point where they were no longer there... Yeah. It would have melted a gun. Well, you could see the gun, like the the, the shell of the car. I'm mean, not the gun, the cars. You could gotcha. see the shell of the cars. You could tell that they were cars there, but they were like, I mean, they weren't being salvaged or anything. Everything was just burnt. Hmm. But anyway, there's still a gun that the police had left there. If you find a gun in a scene, you'd think that you would take it, especially since they already have the information that she had a gunshot wound to the head. Absolutely. You know, the family doesn't even know this at this point, and they still think it's strange that they didn't take the gun. So Hmm. um, if the police are investigating, they should be just taking everything. But so Steve agreed with Nanette's family that the police didn't do a thorough search. And, you know, we all know the first 48 to 72 hours are crucial. Um, So Steve had someone take drone footage of the scene and hired an independent private arson investigator to take a look at it. So that guy sees a shotgun also and carcasses of a couple of their cats who apparently were also shot. We find out throughout this (laughs) story. So, Oh my gosh, somebody just went on a shooting spree in her house. Right. And so all of these are things that the police left behind. And according to some reports, the cats... Oh, I already, I'm sorry, I already said that, but the cats had been shot as well. So the police and fire marshal look at this footage and then go back and do, with another search warrant after realizing that the two guns they had already taken, because they had taken two guns from the scene, did not match the projectile of the wound. So they had two guns, apparently left two guns at the scene. <laughs> and carcasses and debris everywhere. So there wasn't there wasn't a really good search of this property. And I mean, I saw pictures of before and after of these of the the search and it was complete night and day. Like you could see the floor of the house after they did that next search because they had did clear all the debris out and it was right. it was like night and day. So, I mean, they finally I guess they did a thorough search. Um And of course, if you're anything like me, right at this point, you're thinking more guns were found. So (laughs) they have now four guns. And then according to Steve, they had a total of 30 guns. (laughs) Like he owned 30 guns? they had 30 guns. And in my head, I'm like, because I'm not a gun person, I'm just like, what in the heck do you need 30 guns for? I don't know. I mean, do you have an opinion on this? (laughs) Um, That's a lot. Yeah. Of guns, mm-hmm. yeah, for two people especially, like, right. you know, if you're a sheriff's deputy's office and you have thirty guns, that's one thing. But like, right. I guess guns do different things. You yeah. can you hunt different you animals just, yeah, with hunt. certain types of guns, and yeah. if they live on a hundred acres, maybe right. they want one certain gun to kill their beavers and another gun to kill the coyotes and another one for the deer and another one for Nanette and. Another one for the cats. I'm just going to stare. for Nana. Are you already blaming Steve? <laughs> <laughs> um, so there are also a total of nine security cameras on the property and that Steve had installed at the request of Nanette, which we will also get into that later, why she requested that. So because they have all this security camera, they have footage. And let me add here that on that initial search of the property, the police also did not take the DVR footage from the scene either. So they, they've they missed a lot, in my opinion. And I'm not ragging on them, but it's pretty obvious that they missed it too much. So earlier I mentioned the gunshot wound to her head and that the police didn't inform them about it for a week. But what they also mentioned was that there were, they were leaning towards suicide. So they think basically that Nanette shot herself and her cats and then set fire to her house. Hmm. And there's not a whole lot of reason to think that. Nobody, everybody said she was a fun loving person and happy. And she, you know, she was a little scared and nervous about some things. Like I said, I'll get into some of that later, but not anything that anybody thought she would have ended her life over. So 
At this point, her family is losing faith in this investigation, and they ask for a second autopsy, and then a third as well. Hmm. Her sister, Kim, is a prosecutor in Iowa and has some connections, so she had a homicide detective come with a forensic pathologist to do a third autopsy. They were only able to review reports and look at the body and talk with the people who originally did the autopsy. So they had to make their report based on that. And we will talk about their findings after this break. Hey guys, this is Christy and Beth from Crimes and Closets. And we are just two moms that love true crime podcasts. And so we just thought, hey, why not try and make one of our own? But we had zero knowledge or experience in doing that. And then we found Anchor. Guys, Anchor is the easiest way to make a podcast. It's totally free. There's cool creation tools that allows you to record and edit the podcast right from your phone or computer. It'll distribute your podcast to any platform that you choose, including Spotify and Anchor. And you can actually make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership required. It's everything you need to make a podcast all in one place. So if you're as into it as we are, download the free Anchor app or go to anchor.fm. That's anchor.fm to get started. We'll see you in the closet. And we're back. (laughs) So after the third autopsy, Detective Doug Johnson declares Nanette's death a homicide, which is in agreement with all of the other... um, people who did the autopsy. What are those people called? Oh my gosh, I just drew Medical blank. examiners? Yes, the medical or forensic exam, whatever. Yeah, medical examiners. They all agreed that um, it was a homicide. So I don't know why the police initially were saying it's suicide, their idea, but he has stated that there are several reasons why he believes this. He, she didn't commit suicide. Number one was that there was no soot in her lungs because he says that she would have some if he, she even took two breaths when the fire was near her. So in his opinion, she was he, she was dead by the time the fire got to her. Gotcha. Makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. Because, yeah, if you breathe at all, you're going to... So she wasn't breathing when it got close enough. And it was... The fire was started in the living room. There was two places of... Um, that was started. The living room and the master bedroom. So... And then she was in the bathroom? she was in the bathroom, the master yeah. bathroom. So that, that was another thing with the suicide. I was like, well, how is she going to start both those fires and then get in there, kill herself before the fire gets to her? I mean, especially if it's in the master bedroom. Right, absolutely. Right. Anyway. The second reason was her skin didn't bubble, which shows that the fire didn't reach her until she was dead. So I guess if mm. you're, you're alive, your skin's going to bubble more than – because there's still oxygen going through your body is my assumption. Wow. Ew. And the third one is that there was very little blood around her. So when you examine the photos after the soot was all gone and you can see the ground, the gunshot wound to her head would have caused a lot of bleeding. So there would have been, a, you know, even even after a fire, there would still be a, you know, a, a spot of blood that you would be able to see on the floor, according to this guy. Right. So... Was she killed elsewhere and then placed there to cover it up? Because clearly there wasn't blood anywhere else in the house either. So Hmm. where was she shot? That's the question. Well, would they have been able to find blood anywhere else in the house if it was just like... Well, I would think so. If they think they would be able to find it if she was shot in the bathroom, even if... Even with the fire. Yeah. And that's what he said in the interview I watched that it was like, even though there was a fire, you would still see blood. Hmm. Anyway. So... After the results of the autopsy were released, the sheriff called a press conference for the next day and states, they're, basically they called it because they don't agree with the findings. But then the next day, when they are at the press conference, they announce, and I quote, we will work this case tirelessly and, aggr- and as aggressively as a homicide as we have from the beginning. Oh, well, that's not very confidence-inspiring, sir. Right. And especially since you said that you thought it was a suicide. So you have not been investigating it as a homicide. So right. What? And you left the guns. Right. Yeah. You left a lot. You left yeah. a lot. And the cats. DVR footage, a lot. Yeah. If you thought it was a homicide, then you would want that footage from that security camera. I know. They should be your fired, sir. <laughs> oh, gosh. Anyway. So, and then also at that point, I, 
at that point or very soon after, they announce that Steve is the prime suspect, which oh. as most husbands are, they, you know, become a, the prime suspect. They start closest in mm-hmm. and then move their way out. And I will say this. There, there is um, evidence or proof that he did have an affair, but Nanette knew about this for like months or even years before her death. Like there was no reason. They apparently had worked through it and it was fine. Even her friends. So it wasn't like a knew. current affair. No, it okay. wasn't a current affair and it wasn't something that she just found out about. Like she had even known about it well before she died. So nobody really thinks that that's the reason why he would kill her. But two months after he's announced as a prime suspect, he's cleared because he was extremely cooperative with the police and he's also all over surveillance ca- surveillance, surveillance cameras. Sorry, I'm having trouble with that word. At the fire station that day. Mm. So, oh, so they did collect that footage. Yes. Hmm. And I also saw footage of him driving in the fire engine to the scene. So, <laughs> Oh, well. They have, they have footage of him. And so he, he was somewhere there. else. He yeah. was not there. So... Speaking of the surveillance footage, let's go back to the nine cameras that they had on their property. That's a lot of cameras. A lot. They have 100 acres. So what, they got the one at the front gate, at the back. Like, all, it's all over the property. That's oh, total. so it's not just around their house. Yes. Okay. They well, have some in their house and they have some outside their house. Okay. So cause, Some of them could be like, um, like they're called game cameras and they put them oh. out for like, they're like motion activated. And so if you have any wildlife... Like, did they have animals? Their own animals? They had cats. Yeah. That's all I know. Oh. They had cats. Remember? <laughs> well, no, you they wouldn't have shot. them to protect your cats. But <laughs> like if they did have like chickens or goats or cows yeah, or something. I don't, I don't think they did. Um, no, I, not that anything that I read. But what I did read was that Nanette was the one that wanted him to put these cameras in because she was afraid of something. Oh. But these cameras weren't working the night well, some of them, I guess, weren't working the night of the uh, or the day of the fire because Steve said that he was out at like a meeting the night before and the, they're on a MiFi, which I had to look that up, but it's basically like an extender of your Wi-Fi or, or maybe not. No, it's a separate wi- Wi-Fi-ish kind of box. But anyway, that went out and he hadn't had time to when he got home from this meeting to, you know, get it running. So he was just like, I'll do it tomorrow. Um, and there was no, also they didn't have any cloud storage. So when I said there was DVR footage, it was legitimately like saved on a device inside of the house. It wasn't saved on cloud. So that poses a problem. But anyways, they initially didn't take that footage from those cameras, but when the fire marshal did decide to do that, they saw that the camera was actually too damaged to get, and it was doused in accelerant. (gasps) Oh! And there was more accelerant in the master ba- um, bath or bedroom, I'm sorry. And the fire was started in both of those places, like I said earlier. So they could not obtain the footage because it was so badly damaged. Even the FBI couldn't extract anything from the footage. So somebody knew that their box was there. Right. That's what I'm thinking. Like, how, Because how, that you wouldn't walk by it and be like, you know what that is? I'm going to douse that. That is gonna. That is surveillance footage of these hundreds of acres, and right. that's where they store it, right there. Yeah. You would not know that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. So somebody knew. This was in to me, and it's still it's an inside job. I just cannot figure out well, who. <laughs> so, so why did they need all these cameras? According to Nanette's family, she had asked Steve to install them because she was afraid of something slash someone, and she had sent emails for years to her family about Steve's brother Brian who was in jail in 2011. So this is in 2017. So she's been emailing her parents. So I have seen footage of them too feeling terrible that they didn't like take these calls and these emails as seriously as they should have because she's been complaining about him mm-hmm. for a while. Um, so anyway, I'm sorry. He was in jail in 2011 and he had about 15 convictions Ranging from DWIs to battery on a police officer, he was mad at Steve and Nanette because they had failed to help him evade arrest after an accident he was in while he was under the influence. So this was why she had asked for cameras, because she was afraid when he got out, which was around this time, that he was going to come because she had told her father and emailed him at one point saying that Brian said... I'm going to set the house on fire and kill you when I come out. 
Oh <laughs> my gosh. <laughs> I mean, if that isn't a, you know, 100% guarantee it was him, <laughs> I don't know what is. Huh. I mean, clearly hearsay because it's not like we have video of him saying it. However, Brian was out, but he had an ankle bracelet on. Although the parole officer did admit that the GPS was never turned on on that bracelet. Oh my gosh. <laughs> You hear about that all the time. Yeah, I know. It's like, what, just freaking turn it on. Like, what does it take? <laughs> yeah, what does it take? <laughs> anyway, but he was also staying at the, their parents' house, Steve and Brian's parents' house, which Steve installed security cameras at their house as well. <laughs> He's just a security camera installer. I mean, I'm clearly. Sure if you need camera installation work, call Steve. I am not calling Steve. <laughs> <laughs> so there is security footage of Brian at their house during the time of the fire. So now we've got... Well, crap. Yeah. Suspect number two. <laughs> Down so the somebody is trying to frame Brian. Yeah. Or Steve. I don't know. I'm, who knows? They also have issues with the stepson, Justin. You know, he's just a regular kid that's just normal issues not anything bad but he was also out of state at this time so there you go number three now we got nobody so that's where we're at we have no answers and no clue who killed Nanette after now it's been what three years now and after the first two years there were 84 interviews and 65 search warrants executed <laughs> so oh my gosh and they still have nothing they I believe that they think it was her handgun, her own handgun, that was also found next to her. That was the we weapon. So they left that too, or did they take that one? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they took that. Minute, okay. But so anyway, yeah. But still, like just 30 guns. And fire, they never found fire the other. At a fire marshal's house or fire chief's house. Yeah. <laughs> Security cameras everywhere, but you have no footage because <laughs> it wasn't working. And then it was doused in accelerant. So there was an, uh, one article that I had read that did a really good synopsis of this whole thing, which I probably could have just read at the beginning and made this a five-second podcast, but it was more fun to talk about it. But I do want to read this and give the – it was on Reddit, and I'm going to give them credit for this 100%. Because, but So the first person of interest was her husband, a fair a while back, but basically had an ironclad alibi because he was at work and he's a fire chief. So – good the second one was the brother-in-law and he says so he must he did a lot more digging than me because he said they had he had 36 arrests mm. for petty crimes and then also goes into the um reason why he's mad because the night he got arrested he told steve he was going to get out kill us and then himself and those were in quotes that was some facebook exchanges with a friend of his yeah, good idea, Brian. He wrote because he was apparently mad that Nanette stuck her nose in his business and he had to serve a year in prison. You know, I can already tell that that would happen. Yeah. I can already tell that the, that Nanette is the nose sticker and uh, sticks her nose in people's business. And I don't even know her. And the only thing saying, that we've learned about is that she has cats and lives on 100 acres <laughs> and is kind of paranoid. But like, I feel that about her. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know what it is. Well, but I don't know. I mean... Truthfully, if your husband had a brother that had 36 arrests, do you think like you wouldn't meddle in that a little bit if he no. was trying to help him get off or something? No, <laughs> like, I would be like, yeah. bye. Exactly. <laughs> don't, so. don't come around. Right. Yeah. Um, so, but then again, his alibi checks out. So, but then there was also some information that he had found on somebody that wronged her husband. So somebody who wronged Steve, because Steve was the firefighter and this person was also a firefighter. And he just laid out dozens of allegations of sexual misconduct on Steve's part and intimidation and just like was blaming him for a lot of stuff. But then Steve, I guess, didn't get in trouble for it. But he did because he did end up getting demoted, essentially. He wasn't fire chief anymore in the end. So he did get in trouble for stuff. But he, this guy was mad, I think, at Steve because Steve had denied an all those alleg allegations in the beginning and that guy feared Steve was going to retaliate on him. So Steve had sexual misconduct with another fight firefighter. Yeah, I, from what I read, it was like two separate people, like co-workers. Oh goodness. That, I mean, the, the, it was two separate co-workers in the allegations. He, I think admitted to one to Nanette, 
So I don't know if the other one panned out or not. But hmm. um, So this guy apparently feared that Steve would retaliate. So maybe he was afraid of Steve, so he was going after them. Maybe Nanette wasn't the target. I don't know. Um, and then also last, there was apparently a mystery man that was seen outside in Nanette's home in the days before the fires. So about 17 days before she was shot, she had emailed her father. Apparently she emails her dad everything. Um, well, it's smart to yeah. have it all in writing. Yeah. I mean, in hindsight. That's true. That's true. Um, she had emailed her dad that an image actually of a man lurking outside their front gate. So she got it probably from her security footage and said that she was being followed and that she had found a knife and a cigarette butt on the property and somebody has come onto the property. She's just like telling her dad all this stuff. So she also wrote to him, this was the day I got out to go get the mail and looked up and this man was walking towards me and he just looks creepy. And this man still remains unidentified to this day so hmm. so now there's this strange man on the property i don't know i don't that and that's all we've actually found so i i can't tell if this is like you know some stranger happened upon this hundred acre property and annette was there and just decides to kill her i mean that's one version or did um somebody hire someone to mm. kill her because they had an ironclad al alibi and they were on video footage <laughs> elsewhere. Mm. So again, I don't know. I mean, it could be Steve or Ryan, but <laughs> I think the fact that a fire was set, okay, they killed her cats. Mm -hmm. That's personal. Yeah. Well, that's true. Like, I don't feel like you, if you're, if you're a random person, like the cats are not witnesses. Mm -hmm. You you would you would not kill the cats. You wouldn't even know about them, right? Probably, and they're gonna hide, right? You know, because they're cats, right? You'd think the cat, yeah, they would have hidden, and they wouldn't have been right next to her. They were found next to her body, shot. Oh yeah, heck no, man. Yeah, yeah. no, unless she was just hanging out in the master bathroom with her cats, right? Which, well, I don't. I mean, I don't even know about that. Yeah, that's a whole nother podcast. <laughs> but. That's personal, I feel like, to shoot somebody's cats. A random person's not going to do that. That's out for me. Mm -hmm. Unless they have been, like, for, you you know, a long time stalking her and had developed some kind of, like, crazy, like, you know, relationship in their mind. And they right. made it personal and intimate. Right. That's an option, I guess. But, like, he was a fire chief and they set a fire in his house. I yeah. feel like that is – he was the tar – he was the – not the target, but the – um it was an attack against right. him. Right. Like they were going after her to get to him. Right. Knowing he was at work, knowing he would have to go out. Right. He'd be responding and find to his wife mm -hmm. in a fire. I feel like that is more true to me. Yeah. 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 I mean, I hope they find answers someday to this. I, I mean, I don't know how they will after all this because it's just like, where do you even look if you've got everybody that we already think of as a suspect has got ironclad alibis, uh, you know, and they already saw this guy that they thought had something against Steve and they who was afraid of him. But I don't feel like in a person that's afraid of someone would attack. I feel like they would just be staying away. Like if you're afraid yeah. that they're going to retaliate against you, you'd just be staying back and off. You yeah. I mean, if you think they're going to retaliate against you, this is not the way to, to, Solve that. Right. Now you've killed his wife and burned his house down. Right. And yeah. Killed his cat. Him. <laughs> right. Yeah. Or, yeah, for yeah. real. But I guess it does punish him. Yeah, it does. But life. that would be more like not afraid. Like I'm real angry at him. Yes. And yeah. Like, for sure. That's a different emotion, mm -hmm. I feel like, if you're going to try to punish him like that. Right. Mm. Yeah. So, anyway, that's all I got on that one. That's a good one. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm, I'm at a loss. It was interesting, at, like going through it and just seeing all the twists and turns and the things that just went kind of awry in it. But I don't have anything else. Collect the guns. Yep, collect them all. Louisiana all police. Fifty-eight million of them. <laughs> <laughs> Did they ever find the other thirty-two or however thirty twenty 
six? How many I honestly they get, don't know. They got four, right? I don't okay. know. I've only, I mean, really, it's the, it was the two that were there that they saw, the two that they had collected. And then I don't even think Nanette's the one that they said was the one that pulled, the, like, that she was shot with was in that initial count. So it's like I only have a count of five. Oh my gosh. It's just, wow. Yeah. Maybe they were trying to rob Steve and get all of his guns. Maybe that was a... Well, that's, I guess that's entirely possible, too. Yeah. If they never found them. Right. That would be important to know, I think. Yeah. Good question. Sorry, I don't have the answer for that one. Yeah. Hmm. Officially. Okay. I like it. Yeah. All right. That's it. Yeah. Got anything? I don't. I don't have anything else because I am at a loss as well. Yeah. (laughs) But my money is on revenge for Steve. Hmm. Hashtag it. Okay. Revenge Revenge for Steve. Revenge for Steve. It'll be, be a hashtag on this episode. Yep, and Nanette and her cats. And cats. Revenge for cats. <laughs> yes, revenge for cats, yes. <laughs> Thanks for listening, guys. We have been having such a ball getting these case suggestions from you, so please keep them coming. You can find us on Facebook, on Instagram. Send us an email, crabsandclausens at gmail.com. Go to our website. You can send us a message directly through that. You can go to the Anchor website and send us a voicemail, which we would love. That would be yeah. so much fun, right? You mm-hmm. need to hear somebody else's I voice know, on yeah. this thing for a minute. That we'll would be fun. We'll even throw your soundbite on if it's good. <laughs> Ooh, yeah. Yes. Don't curse. Um, but anyway, while you're at it, remember the world is scary. People suck. Hide in your closet, y'all. See you next week. Bye.